Welcome to Muffin Talk. Kia ora and welcome to Muffin Talk. This program is brought to you by the initiative Titi Paunamo, Study and Joy. Today's broadcast is a recording with Professor Thomas O'Loughlin, who introduces us to the context in which the first Christians celebrated the Eucharist. Professor Thomas O'Loughlin is an ordained priest and emeritus professor of historical theology at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Here goes the recording. Now, I want to try and take you into a single household, and I want to take you into a single household in Thessaloniki, Thessalonica uh, in the ancient world. It's right up at the top of the Aegean Sea. It's fascinating because it was one of the great, and still is, a great port. It's a brilliant port city because it controls the east-west traffic on land and the north-south traffic into the Balkans and out the Aegean. And we know there was a very active Jewish community there, and we've actually found their synagogue. Moreover, it was a very religious city because all the religions were competing and in the center of it, the archeologists have been digging now for past 50 or 60 years and they have found just how many temples were in Thessalonica. So this is a very religious place and everyone that you would meet in Thessalonica takes religion very seriously. These are all religion hogs, even though they're traders. And let's, let's assume that on one occasion, the meal is taking place in a household where most of the people, their background is Jewish. And this would be the group that Paul knows about, but it's not the group that he's primarily interested in when he writes to the Thessalonians. He's then interested in a group that are mainly ex-Gentiles. But this Jewish group, they're still meeting every Saturday to celebrate the Sabbath. They're still thinking of the Sabbath as the great gift of rest that God has given them. And on a Friday evening, they're still celebrating their thanksgiving for the creation in the Shabbat meal. So they're blessing at the beginning of the meal and they're blessing at the end of the meal and they're seeing the whole meal. It's not a case that there's a religion bit and a meal, but the whole meal is part of their religious activity. And now, because they are followers of this particular rabbi and his disciples, they're also sharing a meal which expresses their unity, not just as the people of God, but as their unity with this rabbi, Jesus. And some will be very deeply involved in a Judaism that's linked back to Palestine. Others, it'll be a, a Judaism that's very much in the Mediterranean mold. Some will have Essene tendencies. They'll be interested in the people as stepping aside and forming the new community, getting ready for the end. Others will have Pharisee influences. And that is, they're now a priestly people and they'll be emphasizing purity. And they'll be very worried about impure people at the Eucharist. And there'll be others who will be straight Mediterranean Jews, the sort of Jews that produced the great translation of the Old Testament that will become our standard edition, the Septuagint. And they will see Judaism as the perfection of all religions, as Philo did, because it didn't get involved in mythologies about the gods, not like the Greeks, gods fighting and gods having sex and gods getting angry and playing games, but a God who is infinitely greater. And because it's infinitely greater, they're in, they're in infinite dependence. So Judaism is a very varied phenomenon and all those varied phenomena are coming into and forming these early communities of disciples. But just down the road in Thessalonica, there are other groups who they're not sure, they're very clear that they're following Jesus, but they're not so sure about how Jesus relates to Judaism. And whereas the Jews are a bit worried about all these Gentiles coming in who don't really buy into 
the history of God saving acts in Israel, this group are saying, hey, I just want to, I just want to worship God. I don't want all this out of history of, you know, all that stuff that happened way long ago over there in the desert. Hey, not for me. And this is the group that, that, that Paul is worried about. And Paul is saying, well, you've got, it's a bit more complicated than that, mate, you know. You've, if you buy into this, you're buying into the whole history of Israel. And we see those tensions still in the church today. This community, they have other strange things they do. For instance, they're very used to the idea that religion takes place in a temple, and there's hundreds of temples. And every religion is just one more religion. Now, this is, this is literally, in the technical sense of the word, anathema to the Jews. There is one religion, and there are the religions of the pagans. But to these Greeks, hey, man, do no harm. A little bit of astrology, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of something else. And there are some there, and they're a bit worried. Hey, they're just eating a big meal, chitter-chattering about God and all that, and saying words. But they didn't offer a sacrifice. They didn't burn up a little bit of the food, or more importantly, pour some of the wine. Come to think of it, there was no damn altar in that house. Every pagan household in Thessalonica has at least one altar, and most of them have three or four altars. If you were meeting in a middle class household, a shipping merchant, someone like Chloe's household, she's uh, obviously a Greek, she's obviously wealthy, she obviously runs, she's obviously in the, some sort of merchant navy business. And she has a household big enough that an assembly can take place in her household. And we're talking about an assembly between 20 and 30 people. She would have had at least three altars. There would have been one underneath the central fire. There would have been another at the door, from which we would later get the idea of taking holy water before you go out and into the thing. And there would be another in the dining room at least those three. There was probably another in the main bedroom. And you showed that you weren't an atheist by pouring a little drop of wine. And hey, are you atheists? Judaism had only one altar. There was one altar, it was in Jerusalem. Everyone else just had tables. Okay, where's the Christian? Where did the Christians have an altar? Later they would say, well, it's to do with our tables are our altars. And then eventually, the altar language would dominate. You see, there's a problem. The community, whether it's a Jewish community or, or it's a Gentile community, are trying to come to grips for the Jewish community with the new reality of Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings forgiveness. Jesus is the one who establishes the new covenant. And for the Gentile community, it's how do they link into the past? How do you offer sacrifice? in this new religion. Philo says the perfect sacrifice is the sacrifice of words because it is purely spiritual. It rises up, it's a sacrifice of praise that rises up into the presence of God. For the Greeks, it's got to be destruction. Pour out some wine, lose something. And you can see that there's, you can see all these tensions. And this is also part of our legacy. And that's one of the reasons why Still today, there's so much argument. At the one hand, we have to keep the richness of the gospel tradition, but at the other hand, we have to try and clarify those strands that came in and that really have very little to do with the Christian Eucharist. Out there, oh, with pieces calling In the bonds of love we meet For the world a new day dawning And shines a light to greet We're singing This is the day when the hope was calling This is the day when the light did shine This is the day